Independent MP Kylie Tink. She joins me here at the desk. Always love it when I've got actual people in the studio, Kylie, so thanks so much. Job seeker, budget not far away. We've heard the arguments from Jim Chalmers. Do you accept what he's saying there? I think what's going to be really interesting in this next budget that we see is it's actually the first full budget that we're going to see from this government. And so looking at what indicators they're giving us in terms of where they are going to prioritise investment versus where they're going to prioritise generating revenue is going to be essential. At the moment, people who are trying to move ahead on JobSeeker are living on $50 a day. Now, I challenge any of us to think about if that $50 was all you had to cover your rent, your electricity, your most fundamental basic living costs. How many of us could actually survive on that? Um, to me, one of the things that is frequently lost in this conversation is the purpose of Job Seeker is to enable people who have found themselves in a difficult situation to pick themselves up, get the necessary training they need, to re-establish themselves to get out there and find work again. And at the moment, all the evidence that I see is that the amount that we're offering people in that situation is too low and what it means is it perpetuates this cycle of loss for them. So they can't take the time to get re-educated. They can't present themselves in a way that makes them a viable candidate for a new job. Yeah. So I do think we need to address the rate of job seeker, um, but we cannot do that unless we can see what's happening in the overall budget framework. I guess what I would point out, play devil's advocate mm. a bit here, is that the employment rate is pretty low at the moment. Mm. It's, the, the, it's the best rate and it's stayed low for quite some time. That, that might change. Obviously, uh, people on job seeker often have other government benefits as well, and they are assisted in that training. Um, sometimes they, they are living in public housing as mm. well all of these things. So 40% is a lot mm. um, for any budget um, and that goes in perpetuity now. And while the unemployment rate is low now, it might not be in the future. So if are you saying it should be 40%? And if so, something's got to give, right? What should be cut to pay for it? Look, I, the 40%, I'm not across the details how, as to how they came to that number. Yeah. All I know is that the current rate that people are being given is below the poverty mm. level. So we do need to raise it so that people can Perhaps actually move ahead. Perhaps in line with inflation. Perhaps in line with yeah. inflation. But, Laura, I think the other point you make, and this is something I find just as an everyday Australian really confusing. We have all these different types of payments that we offer to people, but frequently they're being offered as a way to disguise another need. So, for example, you look at single mothers, you know, so a single mother who has a child over the age of eight loses single mother payments and gets moved to job seeker. The argument could be made, does she really fit into a job seeker category? Or is she actually still a primary carer and therefore should be receiving that other form of social support that we have? So frequently, I think, where um, the conversation that is really important gets lost around these points is that we get drawn into debating and arguing one particular element of it, mm. when what's actually required is the holistic review of what social supports are out there at the well, moment and who gets access to them. That? Wide scale tax reform. Wide scale Looking tax at reform the is essentially what and we what need. What is affordable? Has it blown out? Do, what about the NDIS? Um, this question without notice. Um, <laughs> It is super expensive. And do you think it has moved away from what it was designed to do? And that is to look after the profoundly disabled. I think with the NDIS, what we have here is a system that was introduced under one form of government. Mm. And I believe it was introduced with all of the best intentions. And then for a period of time, it's become whatever it's become. You know, we've seen unwielding. this government... Unwielding. It is unwielding. And we have seen this government immediately prioritise a review of it. Um, what I would say is that I am quite heartened by the fact, you know, we, we had heard murmurs that the government was going to look to roll out the model that is NDS, NDIS across other areas of community support. So aged care, provision of home services for our elderly. Um, to my mind, it would be crazy to roll the model that is NDIS into any other part of our society until we know we've got the model that is NDIS right. And that's what I believe this government is currently looking at. In its current form, it's not sustainable. Mm. We have to work out what's not working there and how we make it more sustainable going forward, particularly if we want it to be the roadmap for reform in other areas. So you've obviously had discussions with the, the government in the lead up to the budget. Mm. Did you have a wish list? Do you have requests? Uh, what's number one on that list? Look, for me, it actually is housing. I, you know, we have... What a, do you make of the Greens then today? Well, I, it's, it's, in, it's disappointing. 
uh, the housing, it's, it's, the it's housing affordability joke, future fund. Yeah. To me, the housing affordability future fund may not be perfect, but it's a start. Mm. And you know, I've spent a lot of time talking not just to people who work in the community housing sector, but to people who actually work in the housing development space. They all want this fund to proceed. It's not perfect. We need to get it moving. And I think for any political party to hold a major legislative reform to um, ransom for an in exchange for something else, it's just not the way our country is going to move forward well, in the long run. Warfare, isn't it? Well, you saying, you know, tax breaks like negative gearing needs to be scrapped altogether. I mean, the Labor government would be very aware that they tried this once and lost an election. There is no doubt we need to have a conversation in this country about our overarching tax system. We have an over-reliance on taxing individuals at the moment and arguably we tax the wrong things. You know, we, the more someone works or the more they earn, the more they get taxed and surely that's got to be a disincentive for yeah. working harder in so, the long so run. So that's your argument so, to keep stage three tax cuts? I, I absolutely believe we need to keep stage three tax cuts. You yeah. know, this is the final stage of what has been a rolling reform over five years. It's the last time we did any reform in this area and even with that movement, the tax bracket creep we will barely be keeping up. So, you know, that stage three tax reform is a really simple gimme at mm. the moment. And that's the danger I think we always fall into it when is it comes simple, to... isn't it? It's and it's been gimmick. pounced upon by your colleagues in the Senate, like Senator David Pocock. I mean, he seems immovable on this and it seems like if you want more revenue, that's not where you get it. I mean... So my argument again would be that it is, it's a too simple, it's a gimme, it's oversimplified. What we need to do is look at the wider conversation, which is how do we actually tax those forms of wealth that are not anti productivity. Mm. And to me, increasing income tax yeah. is anti-productivity in the long run. So there's a much broader conversation that needs to be had here. I hope this government yeah. can be brave enough oh. to engage in it, yeah. but it is going to take courage. Well, governments in uh, more recent history have not been brave enough to do so. So we will see. Kylie, great to see you. Great to see you.